get by It resides between my eyes Walked through the fire Came out better on the other side See lights like a beach If you find the same And right now I'm feeling like a hundred grand You are listening to Inspired Insider With your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise Testing, testing Just talk on your end for a second um, I asked my wife to marry me after we'd known each other for six days, having met her in the hypnosis laboratory at Stanford. It was almost a question about who hypnotized who. Interesting. I actually used hypnosis for the first delivery, for the first about, I don't know, four hours. worked fine before we got interrupted. Um, but then we went for the epidural. It was more reliable. I uh, wrestled a gorilla. That was Coco. I had to babysit Coco, the gorilla spoke sign language, for a year, for six hours every Wednesday. Do you know how humiliating it is to have a gorilla has a bigger vocabulary than you do? <laughs> How's the volume, okay? Volume's good. It's coming in. Okay. All right. Let's and there's, give you the there's, four- a new, there's a new book, too. Ah, so that's, that's great. I, you should have sent me a mug beforehand, so I would have one, too. I shall send you one. Yeah. Send me your address. I've got a couple of extras. I'm going to send them on to people. <laughs> it's yours. All right. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Dr. Jeremy Weiss here. I'm founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders like the founders of P90X, Baby Einstein, Atari, many more, how they overcome big challenges in life and business. Today, I'm very excited. We have Dr. Michael Fossil. He's had a dream for 30 years to reverse human aging. And it doesn't mean slow it down or stop it. It means literally reverse it. So he's going to talk about how telomerase therapy can help cure and stop age-related diseases like strokes, heart attacks, age-related dementia, much more. He's a PhD and MD from Stanford. He's taught at Stanford and Michigan State, and he's appeared on all the networks, NBC, ABC, many more, about reversing human aging. He's the author of a medical textbook called Cells, Aging, and Human Disease, and the books Reversing Human Aging, and his new book, the telomerase revolution, it's the enzyme that holds the key to human aging. Dr. Fossil, Michael, thanks for being here. Thanks, Jeremy. Pleasure to be with you. Like I said, I can't, if you have a peaching MD from Stanford, I almost feel compelled to call you doctor, even though you insisted Michael, but I'll call you Michael. And I always like to, before we get into some of the, you know, reverse human yeah, aging. I got to tell you, part of the problem is that you and I have both met a lot of people with degrees who don't know diddly squat. And other people who haven't finished college who know more than we do. So I take it with a grain of salt. Okay. Fair enough. Not always. You know, but there it is. Fair True. enough. So, you know, we're going to get into reverse human aging, which is intense. But I always like to include fun facts. And you have so many fun facts. I'm going to list a few. And I'm going to have you talk about one of them in particular because we could spend the whole time talking about them. Some fun facts. Wrestled with a gorilla. bit, Been bitten. Been bitten by a rhesus monkey twice, and you pulled one off the second floor drain pipe. You spent time in a Tibetan and Buddhist monastery. You lived in uh, Wellesley campus and typed term papers for women, the women's students. You taught scuba diving. You did somersaults in a hang glider and somersault ex- exiting from a motorcycle. And you still ride a unicycle. You worked helicopter rescue, doctor's ski patrol in Colorado, and you have a home, you have a rat lab at home and two secret staircases and a secret room with a one-way mirror with almost goes with the last fun fact, which you both your parents were ex-CIA agents. I guess never been confirmed. CIA told me that, but they could be jerking my chain. Wouldn't surprise me. Don't the, look at me. The craziest one is, tell me about the fun fact about your wife. Well, I, I had known my wife for six days and I turned to her one morning. I won't tell you where we were. And I said, will you marry me? She said, yes. And I said, I'm serious. And she said, so am I. So we eloped. Um, we ran after Carmel. We didn't have a reservation. It turned out to be the weekend of the Monterey Jazz Festival. So it was, you know, we were lucky we ended up with a, a manger kind of. Um, but the place was deserted during the daytime. We had a wonderful time. Um, but my my wife forbade me from letting her parents know that we had gotten married. So her parents, to their dying day, thought we had lived in sin. And I'm just, we never did somehow. Disappointing. There it was. So where did you meet? We met in a hypnosis laboratory at Stanford. And of course, the real question was who hypnotized who? Not clear. <laughs> uh, my wife theoretically was not hypnotizable, which is why she was there to, to teach students what it's, how they could be faked out. But having said that, I used hypnosis for the first six hours of her labor, and it worked fine. 
So what was it in those six days that you both knew or that you knew? It's funny you ask that. You know, it was never fireworks and, and loud music and it's what no, it was more like meeting a friend who you haven't seen for ten or twenty years, but was a close friend of yours. And you settle down over a cup of coffee or a glass of beer someplace and you say, What have you been doing? But that that you still click. There was this feeling of of just this was my best friend. It stayed with us for forty years. We were at a wedding the other day where they do an elimination where they, they have people sit down have been married less than a year, less than five years and we were startled to be the last ones up. Wow. The 37-year-old marriage was shorter than ours. So we we're 40 years this year. And after only knowing each other for six days. I know, and I can't figure out why that woman puts up with me. I have no <laughs> idea. I'm afraid she'll open her eyes one day, and that'll be the end of it. <laughs> um, that's amazing. See, she's an attorney. I, as a physician, the, the underlying thread is if there's a problem, she'll sue me, and I'll poison her. That's not a good circumstance. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask you about some of the other ones because those are pretty crazy later. But I wanted to hear about what you're most excited about with the advancements of anti-aging now. Uh, to me, it's, a, it's sort of a cusp. Uh, things are finally beginning to get, break, break away. Uh, I thought 20 years ago the avalanche would start with my first John, uh, Journal American Medical Association articles in my first book because the research was ready. And in fact, um, it turns out that we first reversed aging in cells now 15, 16 years ago. And we first reversed aging in human tissues now 15 years ago. And sort of no one noticed. The articles are hard to read. They're a little dense. Um, but that's what happened. Uh, however, nothing really happened for 15 years. There have been some advances. For example, uh, not only the work with, with oral telomerase activators, like TAO65, yeah. um, but also uh, the work in rodents showing that we can do this by activating telomerase in rats and mice. Um, so I've noticed in the last two or three years, things are just beginning to slide. I had this feeling that it's like the first rock or two beginning to give way on the avalanche. Yeah. So what did the research look like? What was it in 1999 and 2000? What did it show? That was interesting. Um, what, what happened? This was back in Jaron uh, in those days. And there were a group. What they did was they took a human fibroblast. And if you look at old human fibroblasts, they look old, they act old, they don't work very well. They have, an, they have a, an old pattern of gene expression. But when you reset the telomere links in the lab, you not only reset the pattern of gene expression to one that looks like a young cell, um, but the cells begin to act and look like young cells. Hmm. So, again, that suggested we we're on the right track. And then the year later, we began to do that, or Jeremy began to do that that with tissues. They did it, for example, with old skin. You, If I take young skin and I grow it out, or young skin cells, and I grow them out, they, you get what looks like young skin. You do that with old human skin cells, you get what looks like old cells. But if you take the same old cells, reset the telomerase, reset the telomere link using telomerase, um, the cells then grow young skin. Hmm. So, you know, in principle, we had showed you could, you could reset aging in tissues. I used to joke that if we could take all, all your skin, uh, we could give you young skin again, of course, you wouldn't live through taking all your skin off. But right. but the same thing happened with vascular cells, uh, coronary artery cells, that is, uh, coronary, coronary artery cells, um, uh, bone cells, a number of other uh, chondrocytes and joints. So in principle, we knew now 15 years ago that we could use this medically to treat age-related diseases, which is what I'd argued back in 97 and 98 in my Journal of American Medical Association articles. But the question is, was anyone willing to try it? And it, something remarkable happened in 2001 where a couple from California approached me and offered me more than $1 billion current blanche to take this to translational research. Wow. Very exciting times. Uh, six months in before we signed the final papers, they reneged on the whole commitment. And it took about two years before I found out what had happened. They'd gotten involved in a divorce, and I'd gotten caught up in it. Hmm. Not a good time. You ask, you know, one of the things you were going to ask me about low points in life, that was one right there. Um so you know, talk about a very high and then a very low. It was it was a low point. You know? I think we're beginning to now move ahead. You know, in the last year or two, I, I keep finding investors coming to me, hmm. which is unusual for biotech. Usually, it's the biotech or small business that looking for investors. Right. Um, they keep calling me, so that's good. We just have to get the work done. So, what were you going to do with the billion dollars? That's funny um, because everyone, of course, knocks on your door since you've got that. Uh, you know, they all want you to, to fund their research. And I kept saying, that's like saying I, I'd like to fund ballet. 
I'm perfectly happy <laughs> in favor of ballet, but that's not what this money's for. Um, so it was hard to, to be polite, but say that's not what we're doing. Um, I'll give you an example. You know, Bill Andrews is one person we can talk about in all this. Um, Bill has been looking for telomerase activators for years. I, mm. I talked him into it in Italy, you know, darn near 20 years ago, mm. um, and doing a remarkable job. But just down about a mile and a half from, Bill, from Bill's lab, there's a hospital that was doing knee replacements. And one of the things we could have done in those days, and Bill could have done too, would be to, to see if we could actually reset the chondrocytes from those knees in the lab and then in principle say, what if we offered this as an alternate treatment? We would have had to go through the FDA. That's the kind of thing we would have done. So we could have attacked uh, osteoarthritis, osteoporosis, cardiovascular disease, that is strokes, heart attacks, yeah. and so on, aneurysm, and Alzheimer's. We could also attack things like cosmetic uh, aging. My take mm -hmm. is to go after Alzheimer's because it's uh, the opposite of the low-hanging fruit and because everyone knows you can't do anything about it. Well, I think we can. Yeah. A lot of, I mean, the, the options are endless, you know, of what you can do. I think they are, but strategically, I think that we're going to go after Alzheimer's because, as I say, for one thing, everyone knows you can't do it. I think you can. Two, uh, it's it, there's a lot of money out there and, and people who want this done. Uh, three is I think we can more likely get it through the FDA strategically than if mm -hmm. we were going after skin cream for wrinkles. Yeah. Uh, now, there are a lot of reasons why this is the right thing to do Yeah. as well as just plain compassion. Yeah. Yeah, Michael, I want to go back to almost 1999. Like you were saying, I, I want to go back further than that because you said people weren't paying attention but for some reason you were paying attention to that research at the time so i want to go back to early on when you were growing up what did you want to be i mean right now you want to reverse aging what what was the young oh, michael what, what do you want to do god a million things um all well, right you know it's hard to think you, you think of all the changes you undergo i you know originally i did this combined ba masters in psychology um, and in fact, that was kind of a funny deal too. I, di I didn't mean to get the master's, but I discovered a lot of places change the rules after I leave um, because I discovered that you could get a free master's degree because they were charging by the number of quarters you were there, not by the number of credits you took. Mm. So I just doubled up the credits, got a master's degree, and after I left, they changed the rules like what should have been billing me for. Um, so I, I, you know, I sort of thought of going into psych, and then it, I actually had a position offered to me at Andres Pradesh University to go study Satya Dananda was a guy who had written uh, one of the foremost little books on a second century AD Buddhist philosopher named Nagarjuna. Hmm. Fascinating. And I was going to go over there and learn languages, which always fascinate me. I mean, about 14 I saw things. you learn, you know, like five languages or something, right? You're well, there are about 14 things I've gotten one way or another in my life. I've been able to speak about 14 languages, but I forget them all. It's like I can't find my Vietnamese to save my life. Um, I can still remember, you know, it's like bits of Japanese. You know, I, I can't remember much. Um, but I wanted to learn languages. Um, and then what happened was actually I got my GREs back and I thought there was a misprint because I couldn't find the numerator. And it turned out the denominator was 800 and it turned out that was my numerator too and I thought it was a misprint. But my advisor said, you know, you're actually not all that stupid. You probably could go to graduate school. <laughs> so I borrowed three applications at the last minute with three days to the deadline, then drove a moving truck out to California, hitchhiked up the coast, and applied to Stanford. Wow. So when you got to Stanford, did you know what you wanted to do at that point, or what? how did you figure it out? Well, I started off in psych, too. Um, but I, the uh, the joke was that they didn't like me because I was riding a unicycle and juggling in the halls. Um in reality, there was a there was an ethics problem I was having with a professor that I won't get into, who wanted my name on a paper where the data was um, not data I knew the source of. How's that? Mm. Um, and I declined. Um, so on my honeymoon, actually, uh, the department tried to have me tossed out. The dean said, "No, he's got an NSF grant. He's doing great. We'll move him to neurobiology in the med school." Mm. And I came back and they asked me if I wanted to go back to psych. And I said, no, no, I'm perfectly happy to be in neurobiology. Um, actually, I ended up dedicating my PhD to the psych department. Sort of a bit of irony, but, you know. So what eventually brought you to being interested in starting doing things with anti-aging? That's interesting to me. Um, not to everybody, but I, I was teaching um, neuroanatomy. And my fascination was um, development of the nervous system. 
You know, how does the nervous system really develop? And it's phenomenal. It, 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 it's just awesome. Uh, I'll give you an example. The, the connections of the nervous system are the equivalent of me standing on, say, 59th Street and 5th Avenue and reaching my hand all the way out to L.A. to a specific person on the sidewalk by the city hall and not the person beside him. Right. That's, that's, the, that's how, how exact those connections are in right. development. Um, but I got thinking about the opposite end of life, and everybody just sort of waves their hands and says, well, what do you expect? Things fall apart. Big deal. I thought, there's got to be more to it than that. How come people aren't wondering where the complexity is here? So I got fascinated by it, began to study progeric children. These are the children who at age five look like they're age seven. Right. And at, for probably 10 years, I knew all of them every year. We'd gather them together. Really? On the average year, there were about three or four dozen worldwide that we knew of. Um, and I wanted to find a way to fix that. And the problem I had was that I couldn't figure out how you could approach aging. It was easy to do clinical medicine, which I love. But – but intellectually, I wanted to fix aging, and it, there seemed to be a lot of dead ends. The analogy usually is, from my perspective, the blind man and the elephant. You know, they're right about the ears, they're right about the trunk, they're right about the feet, they're right about the tail, but there's an elephant here someplace. Um, and no one could somehow put the elephant together. So for me, it was about 1992 or so where there was a Keystone Conference. Uh, and I went out there deciding to write a textbook on aging. One, found a friend of mine had written one I liked better. And two, I ran into the first telomere data. And I began to see the elephant. So what did you discover? What did you learn when studying and working with the progeria patients? Well, it's interesting. Um, you know, if I really want to understand life, I, I want to understand the extreme. I, it, here's an example. If I really want to understand physics, I don't study billiard balls. I ask about quantum mechanics and the speed of light. That is, I go to the extremes and I say, well, what about the weird stuff? Right. How do you include, you know, it's like if I want to understand the Earth, I don't just look at my garden and say it's flat. I back off a bit and say, darn, it's it's a globe. I'll be darned. But I think the same thing's true in biology. Yeah. If you really want to understand something, you don't just say, well, what do we know about aging? Everything ages. Cats age, dogs age, birds age, horses, pigs. I, everybody ages, right? Well, that's just not true. You look at these exceptions. Uh, you know, some of the exceptions we know about, for example, you know, we all tend to recognize that dogs and cats age, quote, faster than we do. Well, that's interesting. Why should that be? Mm -hmm. It's clearly not just a matter of time passed. Something else is going on. Or you look at progeric kids and you can say to yourself, well, it's not real aging, but it looks like aging, doesn't it? Sure. So is there a, is there a message here someplace? Is there some truth that we need to look at? The, the, to me, the extreme case of this comes when you look at germ cells. You know, it... You and I both know that we're several decades old, okay? But we got that cell from our mother, and we got a sperm from dad. But the mother got her cell from her mother, who got it from her mother, and there's an unbroken biological line of cells that goes back three and a half billion years and didn't age. Yeah. So what happened? Well, the, the temptation is to say, well, that's because single cells don't age and multicellular organisms age. But that's not true. We know some yeast, some Saccharomyces cerevisiae that age. We know some multicellular organisms, some hydra, for example, that don't age. So what's going on with aging? You see what I mean? Those are, I think, where you learn about what's really going on with aging or anything. You look for the exceptions. You look for the weird cases. You look for the things way out in the fringe, and you say, how do we account for all that? Huh. Right. So in 1999, when you – there was that research, right? So where were you at that time, and why were you paying attention to it? I was doing clinical medicine. I've been doing ER medicine for years because I love it emotionally. Intellectually, it had no interest for me, but emotionally, I love doing it. Um, I especially love the fact that I can see patients and never worry about whether they pay or not. That was the delight for me. Said, you know, right. It was simple. Um, in fact, I was forbidden to ask in some sense. I, you know, the hospital wanted the insurance, but not my, not my issue. Um, but um, what hit me, I saw the original data and I saw the articles that came out. Part of the problem with the article, like many scientific articles, is it was written so it was very hard to understand. It was just turgid, and um, you knew it was in it, but, boy, you had to dig to get it. Uh, it's, it's a classic issue. Actually, it's like my textbook. I wrote it that way to make it hard to understand because you're supposed to do that for an academic book, you know. <laughs> um, but, but seriously, part of the problem was it was hard to appreciate what they were really saying. It wasn't just, you know, here's a couple of genes that changed. There were implications here. Um, and part of the problem that, that Jaron and other people had in those days was they couldn't quite believe the implications of their own data. And Jaron, for example, really had three areas of IP. They had 
um, this aging related issue. They had cancer related issues and they had embryonic stem cells. Hmm. And um, somehow they, none of the board could quite believe that you could reverse aging. Right. Uh, and even in cells and tissues, let alone organisms. So they didn't quite see that as something that had commercial potential. Hmm. Um, the embryonic stem cells worried them. Um, they finally sold that back to Mike West, who started another company in the last couple of years. Um, and they ended up selling the, the, the telomerase activation data um, and the IP off to Noel Patton in a process over years. And they kept the cancer part because everybody knows cancer is a disease. We have something that might work. Mm -hmm. But I think they threw out the baby and kept the bathwater. So you know, they almost thought it was a mistake because that can't be true type of thing. I think that's all of us. At some level, yeah. we all know this. You know, it reminds me of, you know, there's a question that you asked me uh, in writing once. You said, well, you know, who would want to do this? And it's interesting because it bears on a, a Pew Foundation study that was done about two, three years ago. And what they said to people was, if you could, would you live an extra 20, 30 years? And the majority of people said no. But I think what they thought they meant by that was, yeah. would you like an extra 20, 30 years in a nursing home? Because the answer is no. But what if you had an extra 20, 30 years playing tennis, gardening, roaming the world, tickling your grandkids, uh, cooking, writing, whatever you're going to do, whatever mm. you like, you're healthy. That's a different matter. And I think that at some level, all of us, when we talk about extending the lifespan, make the assumption that that means more time in the nursing home. It's hard to get a, for us to get around that because mm. that's been our human experience over the past few centuries. You live longer, but you know what? So you didn't die at age 20 on a car accident, but you died at age 80 of Alzheimer's. There's our recommendation. But I think people still believe that emotionally. They do not, do not believe you can alter aging. Yeah. I know that's not true. The question is, can we make it practical? I think we can. Yeah. But yeah. it's not what people believe. Yeah, so when you go from the research in 99, which is reverse aging in cells, to 2000, when they did it in tissues, how hard right. is it to make that jump from cells to tissues? Not easy. Um, you know, when it was done back in those days, 15 years ago, it was done in lab conditions. It was done in vitro, that is, in petri dish, um, where you can do all sorts of manipulation. And I'll give you an example of something like that that's going on now. Ron DePino's lab, he was at Harvard then, now he's in Texas. What Ron did was he took mice and he bred them so they had an on off switch for telomerase. Hmm. So we can turn it on and off. It works very well. For, for example, um, regrowing lost brain tissue and improving behavioral losses in old rats. But I can't do that with people. Likewise, I can't go in gene by gene and put in a telomerase gene. Right. Can I do that in a, in a realistic way uh, clinically? And there the answer is, yeah, you probably can. There are um, two delivery systems and at least four things you can do. I mean, one, you could find a way to put the gene in. Two, you could find a way to activate the gene that's already there, a uh, telomerase activator for example, like astragalus. Uh, three, you could put in messenger RNA, which is what Helen Blau's group did at Stanford early this year, actually late last year, but published earlier this year. Um, and the last way to be put in a protein, which no one's quite tried. We used to think it was impossible, but it's probably feasible. Um, so those are the four things you could kind of do. Mm -hmm. For delivery systems, you could either use liposomes or you could use viral vectors. And all of those are worth exploring. So all of that has just begun to come to maturity in the last few years. The technology is now available to do this. It wasn't quite there 15 years ago. Yeah. yeah and you'd said after the, you know, the research in 2000, there was some groundbreaking in 2011, 2013. Is that what you were talking about with the rats and mice? Yeah, or is I, that... I, well, no, that actually, that was, I was thinking about the telomerase activators. Yeah. The, I, from my perspective, telomerase activators are probably the most elegant approach. The problem is it's hard to find a molecule that only activates telomerase and nothing else hmm. um, because almost any molecule tends to get have multiple effects. Um, so you want something that's specific, it, you know, gets just what you want, doesn't have any side effects. Now, um, back, back in 1996 when I first put out the first book on any of this, uh, I predicted that it would take between 10 and 20 years to get the first commercially available telomerase product. It actually took 11 years. Hmm. Uh, it came out in 2007, and that was when Noel Patton uh, did telomerase activators, TA65. My hat's off to the guy. Yeah. Because not only did he put out a product, but he did something that went beyond that. He made sure that he tested people before and afterwards to see if it had an effect. Right. Um, he didn't have to do that, but he did. And the first study results came out in 2011, the second one, 2013. In 2011, what it basically showed is that people who've been on telomerase activators 
for more than about six months, their immune systems, as far as we could measure it, many of them acted like they were about 10 years younger than wow. before they started. Hmm. So, again, one, it didn't prove it. it you know, it could have been luck. Uh, two, it was only the immune system. Three, it wasn't everybody. Um, but still, it was a start. Nothing like that had quite ever happened before. The 2013 study began to look at cholesterol levels, blood pressure, um, a whole number of other biomarkers. And again, what it showed is that many of these biomarkers showed improvements, which hadn't happened before. Essentially, what we were showing was that there was a measurable improvement in people's, how do I put this, a measurable reversal of aging in some biomarkers. Um, that had never, just never happened before. It's, it might get best guess is it's still only about 5% as effective as we'd like it to be, mm -hmm. but that should be 0%. Uh, let me say something else, which is biomarkers are not the same as, as what you want. Um, you know, it, say I gave you a choice, Jeremy. You could either have a really high cholesterol um, but no heart disease at all, or you could have a wonderfully low cholesterol but die of a heart attack. Right. Um, I'll take, thank you, the, my heart's fine, never mind the cholesterol, because cholesterol is a biomarker. Right. And it's an important one, but it's not the same as disease. Right. But the same thing's going on here. We're looking at biomarkers. That's different from showing that people – we're really younger, lived really longer, we're healthy. We know the biomarkers look good, and that's a good. That's like having low cholesterol, but that's not the same as not having heart disease. So we'll wait. We'll see. Yeah, and for people who don't know, the TA65 is an oral pill, right, that people can take um, yeah. kind of like a supplement, essentially. Yeah, and, yeah, and it brings up a lot of questions. You know, one is side effects. Does it cause cancer? No, it apparently doesn't. I mean, there's a lot of reasons to think that I won't go into, but probably doesn't. Two is, what about the cost? And the answer is, you're looking at a couple hundred dollars a month. Can you afford it? Oh, it's more than that. Yeah, it's like... Well, it depends, it depends on your dose, but you know what I mean. Right. Yeah. You're not dealing with $50. You're dealing with several hundred dollars a month. Yeah. And, and if you have a large income or pension, it's probably worth it. If you don't, it probably yeah. isn't. But it still begs that last question, which does, does it really work? And the answer is, probably. So don't look at me to say you should take it. My best answer is that's a good question. Yeah. yeah really good question. Yeah. No, Honestly, I think, good question. I think when I looked it up, it was like five or $600 a bottle just to give people an idea. I mean, you could literally, you could get it on Amazon. So. Well, again, it depends how fast you go through the other bottles. Right. You know what I mean? Whether you're taking two a day or four a day or one a day. Um, so, yeah. What it, makes it so expensive? So um, I One, I don't know. I mean, I... I don't work for Noel. I, I think the world of what he's done because he had the guts to do it yeah. and because he you know, did these studies, which matter to me because they show me it may work. Um, but that's part of the problem with the cost of it too, which is yeah. he really wanted to make sure these studies got done. Beyond that, I can't tell you. Yeah. you know, I, I don't know how much of that is, is product and how much of that is profit, and it's not my business. Right. No, I just was wondering I, if there's like a certain ingredient there that is extra costly because obviously it's – you know, a lot well, of technology goes into that. No, I mean, it's extracted from the root of Astragas membranaceus. Um, in fact, you can buy the seeds online, but good luck growing the root high enough. And if you buy the, the tea of it in, uh, you know, in Chinatown in either coast, um, the measures that some people have done suggested that it's inactive because they haven't extracted the right thing from it. Um, we also, the, the other question, you know, Noel has a patent on its use um, for this purpose. Um, so there are all sorts of legal issues involved that mm -hmm. aren't my business. Yeah. And the other question is, if, if four other people are selling what they purport to be a stragulus root, is it really and is it doesn't have an active ingredient? Um, I'm pretty sure Noel is honest about this. I don't know about other people. I'm not saying they're not. I'm saying I don't know. Right. Got right. me? Don't know. Right. I don't know a single source you can go to to say – a, B, and C are, are producing real astragalus. C, D, and F aren't, and you can trust them. There's no you know, good housekeeping seal of approval on this. Right. So what, added, or, you know, Michael, what are some of the upcoming human trials and research that you're seeing? Um, well, there are a lot of things going on. I know a group that's interested in going um, sort of off the reservation, that is doing offshore trials for Alzheimer's. Mm -hmm. There's a group called BioViva. Uh, friends of mine, nice people out in Seattle. Um, I'm not officially associated with them in any way because, again, they want to go around the FDA. Yeah. And I wish them luck. Um, but, you know, what I'm trying to do is get a group of us to go on do FDA trials. Mm -hmm. uh, and we are probably at this point about a year away from human trials, depending on a lot of things I can't control. 
Liz actually said you must talk to Michael. Liz is wonderful. Liz Parrish is the one who, you know, is heading up BioViva. Yeah. Um, and and I, I keep I talked her into going after Alzheimer's and um, and and she she talked a lot with Bill Andrews and as I say they'd like to do this as fast as possible. Good luck. I I agree. Um, but again, there are disadvantages in going non-FDA. You know, one is the FDA isn't going to like you. Well, true. Um, two is, you know, the the question of um, safety and security for the patients. Um, you know, how do we be sure that what's going on is safe? It can be done. But the third thing is that if anything goes wrong with those those trials, it'll make it tougher for me in the FDA. And Liz and I recognize that. Mm -hmm. So again, I, I have no official association with Liz. I wish her all the best. Happy to talk to her anytime. Um, but I'm going to try doing this. I'm not going to say right, uh, but doing this the official FDA way, mm -hmm. uh, or in Europe the EMA way, the you know European mm -hmm. medical. Um, and and Liz, last I heard, is going to try this offshore. See what happens. So, what are some of the challenges doing the FDA way? Well, um, the cost is enormous, particularly once you get to phase three. Um, it, which can be variously estimated in many ways, but you know, 250 million, not at all unusual figure hmm. um, for a phase three trial. It depends how you count it um, and what kind of trial. Um, but you know, I, one of the questions that's gonna come up for us is what do we still need to do to get from where we are to getting an IND from the FDA that is an investigational new drug permit. And it really depends on what rodent data we have and then the gap. Mm -hmm. It wouldn't surprise me to have the FDA say you need not only more rodent data, you may need some dog data, some research monkey data, some other data. And what we need to do is find out what that gap is mm -hmm. and meet it. Mm -hmm. So that's expensive. Now, uh, that's that's not as expensive by a long shot as human trials, as you might guess. So basically, you you want to get to the human trials as quickly as possible, by, and they want you to provide as much data from the animals before you get to those human trials? Yes, um, but remember what we're trying to approach. You know, if I were trying to, to treat wrinkles, uh, the FDA, and appropriately so, would be very careful because people do actually die of aging skin, but not many of them. You know, you don't die of wrinkles, you die because the infection got through your decubitus ulcer. Okay, so the cosmetic issues are, are taken, uh, how do I put this? There's a, a higher a level of proof required, a higher level of data mm -hmm. required for that. On the other hand, if I'm going after Alzheimer's, think about it. Let's see. What drugs are there that slow Alzheimer's? Uh, none. There are five drugs in the global market. There's a $10 billion market for those drugs, and not one of them is a disease-modifying agent. Hmm. Secondly, let's see. What's the outcome if I have Alzheimer's? The mean lifespan after the diagnosis of mild cognitive impairment is seven years, and it's 100% fatal unless something else kills you. If you have an automobile accident at first, if you get pneumonia, but I'm sorry. There's no reprieve. You've got Alzheimer's, and you know what's going to happen. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, you it's, know, one uh, of the, besides that, besides the death part, it's just the process that yes, the family and the person goes through is even worse. In, in fact, when I mentioned the cost of that, you know, it, there's a $10 billion global market for those five drugs, more or less. It depends on which year you're looking at. But if I'm looking at the actual costs, in the U.S. alone, you could be looking at Hundreds of billions of dollars for yeah. nursing care, people right. out of work, people taken care of, exactly. the social work. It just goes on and on. Um, so this is, you know, and that's just something you can measure. What about the compassionate issues you can't measure? They're enormous. Yeah. People, uh, it's a horrible disease. So one of the reasons we want to go after that is because of it. So it, let, it, let me give you an example. Say I came to you and I said, Jeremy, you've got a bad knee. I think we can go ahead and give you an experimental gene therapy that'll fix your knee for you. And you're thinking... Yeah, but I can get a $50,000 knee replacement, and it's not an experiment, and it doesn't involve gene therapy, and I don't know if I trust these guys. Well, that's still $50,000 and a lot of pain and effort. Um, but if I come after you for Alzheimer's, you're not going to say, well, I've got an option. You're going to think, that's it. Uh, yeah, anything you say. Right. As long as you're com you know, convinced I'm not a flake. But let me give you an example of this. Say that I said I could fix your knee for you, but in 10 years, you'd get leukemia. You'd say, eh, you know what, I Forget think it. I'll get the artificial knee. But if I come after you and say, I don't know what's going to happen with regard to cancer in 10 years, but I can stop the Alzheimer's, you'd say, it's worth it. Yeah. You know what I mean? That's not true if I'm dealing with skin condition or knee condition. Right. But when I have something like Alzheimer's, it's that 
not fail on that fast. Um, it, there are risks you're willing to take you might not otherwise. Now, I think there's no good reason why we should think that, that this will cause cancer. Again, for data reasons, not just guesswork. But the point I'm making is that you're willing to accept more risk for Alzheimer's than you would for most things. Sure. I would. Yeah, for sure. I mean, someone is deteriorating and going to die as opposed to a chance that they can reverse it. You know, they're, they're in the doesn't. meantime, I'm going to lose my soul. Yeah. In the meantime, my soul is going to get eroded away to nothing. Thank you, no. So is that the, you think, the thought process behind Liz? Just She just wants to get to human trials as quickly as possible. And there's people out there who, who are willing to try it because they just, there's no other option. Yeah. No, I, you know, I, I've got a, a little uh, registry of patients, and it, if I just wanted to open up and say I had, if I had a drug right now and I opened it up, I would have thousands in a matter of weeks. Yeah. I don't have something I can do right now, and yet you can see why people want to go as fast as possible. The CEO of the biotech company that I'm starting, Telesite, uh, his mother has Alzheimer's disease. So, yeah, he'd like to see it done now, now not right. years from now. Yeah. So how long do you think it will be to get to human well, trials for FDA? I'm going to give you, again, my, my optimistic, semi-realistic offer, which is, uh, you know, I'll be able to prove I can do something about Alzheimer's within a year or two. Wow. Best I can say. That's quick, yeah. Uh, I think so. But it depends on a lot of things. You know, as I say, it's, this is a strategic issue for us. Um, approaching Alzheimer's is, I think, the best bet because of the fatality and the lack of treatment. Um now, the FDA has at least three categories of what you might cause fa call fast track. They have fast track, accelerated approval, and breakthrough therapy. Theoretically, we'd qualify for all those those special tracks. Um, well, one, do we really? Will they accept it that way? Um, two, do we have the data to support first in human trials? Good question. Three, what about the financing? Four, what about the people? You know, I, I just did a review in my new book where I'm talking about biotech over the past 20 years. And what I've noticed again and again is that when biotech fails, it's not a failure of science, it's a failure of the people. Hmm. Again and again, it's the people were not up to the task. They were either rude or they have infighting or they couldn't believe what they found or they whatever. Um, so those are the kind of obstacles people don't see. The financing is pretty real. Yeah. The human, human beings being human beings is there and it's real. The FDA is pretty obvious and um, it depends. You know, we plan to work with them as closely as we can. We want to meet their needs, and they're probably going to try to work with us too. Yeah. So, Michael, what does the administration of that look like? Like, let's say a patient, you know, you have a patient, they have, you know, Alzheimer's, and they want to get the treatment done. What does it look like as far as they taking it? Is it a shot? I was talking to Matt Ridley the other day, he asked me about that, about the shot, and I said, you know, as you mentioned, we probably could make it a pill or a nasal a nasal spray, um, but it's a shot. I mean, initially what it would be is the IV delivery. Um, so theoretically, this is what would happen. Jeremy, you'd come in and you'd say, you know, I've got what looks like early Alzheimer's. We would agree with you. Uh, we'd bring you into the clinic or the hospital, start an IV, give you the medication, watch you for an hour, send you home, and follow you up weekly over the next few weeks to see if something was getting better, both in terms of things we can measure by telomeres and in terms of your behavior, for example. And your, for that matter, your PET scan, your MRI scan, whatever we do. Yeah. In in uh, fear of getting too technical, but I like getting a little technical. When that IV goes in, then what's actually happening? Is this where the the telomere activators are finding the certain you know telomeres to lengthen them, or what's what's actually going on with that? Well, um, no. I mean, the the telomerase activators are the is the route that again Bill Andrews has been looking for mm -hmm. a long time and. We've got some data that it works, but it's not as good as either Bill or I or other people would want. Mm -hmm. The protein, as I say, no one's quite tried it, and there are some problems with it, but could work. The messenger RNA that Helen Blau did at Stanford, the, the problem is it's a very delicate molecule. Um, so for many reasons, probably the best molecule is DNA that is putting in a gene. Hmm. And this is what Mario Blasco's group in Madrid did at CNIO. It's, a, a, it's one of the top preeminent cancer research institutes in the world, but they were using telomerase gene. Um, and as I say, there are two ways of delivering it. You can do it with a liposome, which is basically a little bag of fat, like a, a miniature cell, artificial cell, or a virus. But in each case, what you need is an envelope and a letter. Um, yeah, if I take a typical virus, it's got an envelope that has an address on it, says what it's going to attack, 
And then it's got an inside part, which is the letter. It's the part that goes into your cell and says, make more virus. Right. Now, if we use a viral delivery, what we do is remove the, remove the letter, take it all out. We keep the envelope with the address on it, says, I'm going to go to the following cells. And then we put it on our own letter. And our letter says telomerase DNA, um, a promoter, actually two telomerase genes to make telomerase, but a promoter, please make this. And the virus that we use delivers it where we want, and then it goes on to make the gene that we want. So that's probably the most effective way of doing it. Hmm. Well, that's pretty amazing. And, and again, that's what worked well in mice so far. So yes. Huh. So I want you to talk a little bit about the book, The Telomerase Revolution, okay. um, and some of your favorite parts, what people should know, you know before they get it. Well, the fun part for me right now, I mean, it, it comes out in October of this year. And as of four months before publication, it was already um, high in pre-sales. It was uh, beating out books that come out that same month in the same category. which surprised the heck out of me. Wow. Um, that probably wasn't very many total books, but it was good enough. Um, but the, the book is, is meant for people to read who are curious. You know, I, I'm not a physicist, but when somebody publishes a little article on black holes, I might want to read it. Um, you know, likewise, if I'm not an anthropologist, but if somebody publishes an article about Neanderthals, I'm thinking, oh, what's that got to do with it? That's interesting. That's the same thing here. This book is not meant for anybody with a medical or scientific or, or research background. It's meant for people who like to know. Yeah. Um, so, it, it, you know, I sometimes think of it as the NPR crowd, but really what we're looking at are people who are curious. They're, they're yeah. relatively educated and they're curious, but they're not experts. Or yeah. if they are, they're experts in something else. Um, and it starts off really by, by talking about aging, what it is. Um, talks a little bit about how age-related diseases really work. Um, and then moves on to talk about what we can do about it, specifically what we are doing about it right now. Mm -hmm. um, here's an example. Um, if I look at, at, at age-related diseases, and I'm looking at Alzheimer's, most people know there's a gene out there called ApoE4, and they think that's a gene that causes Alzheimer's. Well, in fact, most people with ApoE4 don't get Alzheimer's, and most people who get Alzheimer's don't have ApoE4. But it's sort of the best biomarker, we, genetic biomarker, we sort of have. Mm. Um, but it doesn't cause Alzheimer's. Here's the analogy that I like to use. Every morning, you you live across the lake, as it turns out for me. Let's say every morning I get in a high-powered speedboat and I speed across to Chicago to come see you. Um, and every day I speed back if I were fast enough. And I never have a problem. But let's say that there's a hidden rock, a reef down below there, a few feet down. Okay? If the lake level goes down, sooner or later as it goes down, I'll hit that rock. That's ApoE4. Everybody may have it. Even if they don't have it, they may have ApoE2, which is even a lower rock. But the problem is not the rock. The problem mm -hmm. is that the lake level has gone down. Right. People focus in on all these little rocks. They focus in on, uh, you know, there are about oh, almost a dozen genes that have been implicated easily in Alzheimer's. And yet none of them really are Alzheimer's gene any more than ApoE4 is. Mm -hmm. um, but they focus on the rocks. The real problem is the lake level. And what we know from the mouse and rat studies is that if you reset the level of the lake, the rocks aren't a problem. Right. It only becomes apparent if the rest of the stuff is malfunctioning. Yeah, we all have hidden rocks. We all have genes that cause problems if you live long enough. But if you reset the level of the lake, not a problem. So, Michael, what's one of your favorite stories from the book? From the book? Yeah, from, yeah. I'm trying to think of all the stories. I suppose I, in the book, I suppose I stole, told the, uh, the Coco story, did I? I can't remember. Coco is the gorilla. Coco, years ago, everybody knows, maybe everybody knows, Coco is a gorilla who swoops sign language. And for a year, I babysat her. Every Wednesday for six hours, I'd be the babysitter for the gorilla. And I'd throw her up in the air and catch her and kiss her. And, in fact, I taught her not to bite because one day, rather than just telling her not to bite, I bit her back. She said, bad you. And I said, bad you. You started first. <laughs> but the, the embarrassing thing for me was that I had to learn sign language. And even the day I left, Coco had a bigger vocabulary in sign language than I did. How humiliating. So you bit the girl with that? Oh, I bit her back. Yeah, she bit me first. I bit her back. <laughs> we play all sorts of games. God, it was fun. I still have the video around someplace. It's online. We can find it probably on the website. I will website. definitely find that. Yeah, Is fun. that online Let's somewhere? I think it's. Uh, I think you can find it on my website. Okay. I checked out your website. I didn't see it. So I'll have to look again. If not, I'll have to put it on there. Yes, please. Um, okay. So what's different? You know, you wrote reversing human aging when? 
1996 it came out. So what? Got me on Good Morning America. Got me all over the world. Yeah. Came out in six languages, but not much really happened. Yeah. So what's different and what's the same from what's in the the new book? What's the same is that it's still written for for general people. Yeah. It's not written for an academic crowd. Uh, you know, my 2004 textbook for the Oxford Press was an academic book. Yeah. Um, and this is not. This is meant for everybody to understand. What's different is instead of me hoping to see the avalanche start, I'm beginning to see those rocks shift. Mm. And you know, more and more biotech companies like Telesite, Biotech, BioViva, and so on, trying to get this thing done. More people who say, yes, I see what you're trying to do. And as I said, back 20 years ago, trying to get a biotech company going was a matter of finding investors. And now what I'm finding is that people are calling me. Hmm. Um, and that tells me something. And when I walk into a boardroom, instead of having people say, you've got to be kidding, I'm hearing people say, telomeres, this rings a bell. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, and you made these predictions based off of some of the research that was going on 15, you know, 15 years ago. What's your prediction 15 years from now? I see no reason, no good reason, uh, things happen. No good reason why Alzheimer's shouldn't be a thing of the past in 15 years. If I look back now, you know, in 1950, most parents, if you said the word polio, panicked. Now, if I say the word polio to my patients or, or young, you know, young adults, they have no idea what that should, why that should scare them. Polio, schmolio, who cares? Get the, you know, whatever. Right. Okay. Um, it doesn't scare them. And I think that's exactly what will happen to the next generation. Mm -hmm. They will look back and you and I will remember what it, in a big audience when I ask how many people have a family member or friend with Alzheimer's, about 90% of the hands go up. Somebody knows. Yeah. But I think what will happen is that in 15, 20 years, the new generation will think, Alzheimer's, so what? What? A, come on. That's a thing of the pet. And I, for one, look forward to that day. Yeah. And, you know, we're talking a lot about telomeres and aging. Just if you could explain a little bit about the role of telomeres in aging. It's probably in your book, too, so people can understand what we're talking about, the therapies and, and your thought process. Um. Most people, most researchers, and, and I don't mean to be unfair to them, it's, getting, it's like the blind man and the elephant. They're all focused on the elephant's ear without looking at the elephant. But most of them focus on the trees, not the forest. So if I'm looking at NAD+, for example, there's a, a colleague I know at Harvard who looks at NAD+. To me, what he's done is he's focused in on the lichen on the small root to the northwest side of the tree uh, that grows in you know quadrant 921 of the forest. And the work is correct, but he's missed the forest, not only for the tree, but for the lichen on the grows on the root of the tree, you know, um, and a lot of the research is like that. And what we're missing is the forest. So let me give you a concrete analogy. Mm -hmm. The difference between the cells in my finger and the cells in my eyeball are not that there are different genes. They are pretty much precisely the same genes, but a different pattern of expression. It's like they play a different tune. Okay. But the same thing is true of my genes in my body. The difference between uh, my cells now at age 64 versus my cells at age 6 is not that they have different genes. It's not even gene damage. It's that I'm playing a different tune. The tune is the wrong tune. Uh, you know, so if I have a symphony orchestra and my symphony orchestra is playing uh, Grateful Dead um, and now suddenly switching to Mozart, that is not the fault of the violin, the bassoon, the oboe. No, that's the conductor's choice of score. That's what's going on in aging. The difference is not that there is an aging gene. It's not there's an aging violin. That's not the issue. It's not the bassoon. It's not the oboe. It's not the piccolo. The problem is the conductor is playing a different score. So like the level of the lake, it's not a matter of the rocks. It's the water level. Like in aging, it's not a matter of the genes. It's a matter of gene expression. There's been a, a wholesale change in biology in the last 10 years, beginning to appreciate the value of epigenetics, not just genetics, but epigenetics. Because you can have the exact same genes as someone else, but if the epigenetic pattern is a little different, you will be different. And that's what's going on in aging. So what we know is that we can reset that pattern of gene expression. We do not have to correct your superoxide dismutase to make you live longer. What we need to do is change the expression of that gene for superoxide dismutase. That's the key. People are just beginning to get this, but most people still. I was at a, a, a global aging meeting about two weeks ago in L.A., which I won't mention the name of. But, but again, almost everyone there was focused on a gene, a gene product, a protein, messenger RNA. And they're missing the orchestral score. 
Right. They're focused on the violin. In fact, they're focused on a particular string of the violin, and they're missing the point. So what do you tell them? What should they be doing? Well, I kind of don't because, you know, if you spent your whole life focusing on a particular E string and a particular stringed instrument and somebody t wants to talk about the score, you know, what, you, what you're sort of saying is what you're doing is missing the point and people don't right. take that well. Um, so really what I did was I, I, they were looking at me to become uh, a – to take over an administrative role for this organization. Um, and I want to do that not because they're wrong, but because I want to make sure that they don't end up missing the boat in five years. I want to make sure right. that they are a little more encompassing and they bring in these people like Rhonda Pino and mm. Rhea Blasco who are showing that we can do far more about aging than just dealing with an individual string and an individual stringed instrument. Right. Yeah, I mean, so if you're being completely honest with them, again, it's not saying their research isn't good. I mean, there's probably, there's uses for it. Um, what would, if you were just being blatantly honest or like, listen, Mike, uh, I want you to just to tell me how it is. What should I start? Where should I shift? What should I do? Okay. Well, let me look at it this way. You know, t to me, I don't think about these things as a scientist. I think of them as a clinician. Yeah. So, it, you know, it's like when somebody wants to tell me about renal failure or diabetic ketoacidosis, to me, the issue isn't intellectual. How does this really work? The issue is, okay, what can I do about it? Right. I've got a patient with renal failure. I've got a patient with diabetic right. ketoacidosis. Just make them better um, because that's what the patient wants. You know, right. I used to be, try to beat this into my residence. The, the patient almost never comes in looking for a diagnosis. They want you to do that if that's what it will take to make them better. But what they want is make me better. Right. And to the extent that involves understanding the intellectual underpinnings of aging, that's useful. But for right. me, the simple question is what can you do to make these things better? So let me put it a different way. My question is not – where can we intervene? But where is the single most effective point of intervention? Mm -hmm. uh, some people have often said that I, that I argue that telomeres cause aging. Nope, I don't. What I say is it's part of this enormously complex cascade, but it's probably the single most effective point to intervene in the process. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, say I've had a thousand change gene expression. I could one by one try to change all the genes. But wouldn't it be better to change the pattern of gene expression if it's orchestrated by the telomere? I think it would. And the data supports that. So my question is always practical. Where can I intervene that works? And if it, I'm looking at NAD+, plus, or I'm looking at resveratrol, or I'm looking at APOE4, or I'm looking at any number of genes or proteins, but to me, that's like, again, saying I can go around to each individual member of the orchestra and tell them to change a different tune, but why don't I just have the total score change for the whole orchestra and tell the conductor to play Mozart? Yeah. Yeah, doable. So essentially it's that... That IV, you take that human trial, they, they get the IV, that would be the single most effective point of intervention. Yeah. In Italian, it's Deo Volante. In Arabic, it's Inshallah. God willing. Yeah, it should be. We'll see. I, I used to tell my all my residents and my students, you know, that guesswork's okay. Logic is a lot better, but data trumps them all. Yeah. Um, so never mind what makes sense logically or what I can argue. The question is, what's the data show? As I used to say to the residents, you know, if, if you show me data that blue crystals cure melanoma, so be it. The fact that I thought that was silly cuts no ice. If it works, it works. Um, but I mean that. You know, it, you have to revise your logic if the data supports something else. In this case, the logic supports that the best way to, tr to treat Alzheimer's is not by going after beta amyloid, top proteins, or anything else. None of those trials have worked well. But by going after gene expression in the microglia. However... What we need to do is find out if that's true. And the data supports it in mice, supports it in rats. Will it support it in human patients? The answer is, let's find out. I do it. Yeah. So, like you're saying, while people are waiting for those things, what can people do to slow aging now or the, the loss and shortening of the telomeres? People ask me that, and the answer always is, you know, not a sexy answer. I tell them. And listen, you, your grandmother gave you good advice. Your doctor gave you good advice. He charged more. Go with your grandmother. She's cheaper. And the advice always was, you know, eat right, exercise. As I say, fasten your seatbelt. Don't antagonize people with loaded weapons. I mean, this is pretty easy, right? <laughs> um, you know, um, I, my, one time I was invited to give a talk in Jerusalem. My wife didn't want me to go because I might get shot. And I said the odds are higher I'd get shot in several American cities I can think of than in Jerusalem. But I understand what you're saying. But, you know, it's – but those are the real risks. The real risks are the traditional ones. You know, you should, we should all eat better. I know that. 
and I'm still going to eat chocolate because who wants to live forever on sawdust, right? Um, and exercise, and that's fine, but, you know, come on, get real. So the real advice remains the same. We all sort of know what it is, and we all get crazy about it. We go for the nutty diet of the month, right. um, never mind which one it is, but they're all nutty. Um, and like, later on, we realized this. And the classic for me is in, 19, in 1899, there were a series of articles out in the German and American medical literature suggesting that since we knew that sugar, simple sugars ran cell processes, that sugar was, quote, nature's perfect food and we should eat nothing else. Well, that sounds pretty dumb now. Right. But how many of the diets that we recommend now turn out to be dumb? You know, it, in the 1950s, everybody was saying, stay away from eggs and butter. We should have oleo. Well, now we look back and think, you know, that was a dumb idea. It's all this trans fat. My God, butter is a lot better. Besides, well, uh, so I take it all with a grain of salt, figuratively and literally. Right. So, okay, let me ask this question. So slowing aging, what about if someone wants, is there? Oh, wait, let, me, let me say that. You right. can slow aging. I mean, all you know, we, most of us look younger for our age than did our great grandparents. That was more stress back 20 years. So you can slow aging by avoiding stress, eating. But you're right. Then that bring comes next question. Yeah, well, you can slow aging, but as for the stopping and reversing, go right, right ahead, Jeremy. Right, exactly. So what if is there anything we can do to stop or reverse aging? Well, you know the traditional. The traditional biological answer is we knew three things that affected aging. One was um, caloric restriction, dietary restriction, hmm. um, and it probably works in human beings. Uh, I, the joke always is that we are the experimental group. The the control group was us living 2,000 years ago in the steppes someplace and, and barely getting through the winter. Right. So we were all sort of semi-starved and on dietary restriction, which is right. why we were healthy. And now the experimental group is we all go out and eat fast foods and have a great time and get fat. Mm -hmm. um, but we know that that works. The second thing we know is breeding. You can breed animals, almost any animal, for longer or shorter lifespan, mm -hmm. which uh, never mind the fictional accounts from Robert Heinlein, but it doesn't work. I mean, it's, well, it would work maybe for your great, 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 but, you know, it doesn't help you and I. But the third approach always is genetic. And we know a number of approaches that seem to do that, including things like caloric mimetics, which may affect gene expression. But the real bottom line seems to be to re-extend telomere links, reset gene expression, and that's not something you can do at home. Hmm. Um, there are a series of articles that looked at things like this. Uh, you know, the classic studies were things like putting you on a meditation diet, a, a, a vegetarian diet, lowering stress in your environment, uh, and they purported to show that telomere links got longer. But unfortunately, the studies weren't well done. Um, what they I, I don't let me get it, give it wrong. I, what they recommended probably is a good recommendation, but the idea that that extended telomeres is probably not accurate because right. the analogy is this. It's like, let's say I take a block in Chicago, your town, and, and let me go back 30 years and I look at one particular block in the uh, South Chicago area someplace, and the average age of the people was 75 with a lot of World War I veterans living there. And now we go down, and the whole place has changed. There's been a little urban renewal in that particular block, and the average age now is 32 with a bunch of young kids and some yuppies moved in. And it's not that that block got younger. It's that the population changed. Right. So a lot of these studies were looking at things like white cells in the bloodstream. And they're looking at different populations. Those populations are dynamic. They're being turned over all the time. The right. fact that now they appear to show younger cells doesn't mean they're younger cells. It just means they're different cells. Right. They happen to be younger. Right. So, again, it, it, those things may be good to do, but yeah. that doesn't prove you can extend telomeres by doing them. Not at all. Yeah. See, yeah, from what you're you, saying, yeah. it makes me want to now research the best way to do caloric restriction. Like other recommended ways to, because the only thing that we can actually do probably ourselves without getting one of these therapies is to do a regimen of caloric restriction. Is there, a, is there something that's recommended out there? Well, I mean, there are. There are recommendations yeah. out there. And yeah. let you wander through them. But I just I want to remind people that when you do that, um, the last thing you want to do is increase your stress level by, by focusing so rapidly on diet that you mm. end up being sick. Um, so it, it is true that you know if I'm a rat in the lab and I, I lower the diet by 30%, those rats live longer and they look sleeker and healthier. Mm. But if, if you start to do that and you go crazy about it, mm. um, good luck to you. Again, my, my typical analogy, my extreme analogy is if I could prove to you that you could live twice as long and be twice as healthy, 
if I locked you in the dark in the basement and fed you sawdust, would you do it? <laughs> no. No, I'd have a double chocolate mousse and I'd go outside and get a suntan. I mean, I'd do dumb things. Why? Because they add joy to your life. And, sure. uh, you know, I mean, there are even patients literally have said, go out and have a cigarette. Not because I recommend it. It's bad for you. But so is stress. And sometimes the mm. answer is relax. Uh, you know, I've had several patients in my life who came in complaining their blood pressure was too high. How do you know that? Because I've been taking it every five minutes at home with my blood pressure machine. <laughs> Great. I can solve this problem. Take away your blood pressure machine and your blood pressure will go down. It, it, I mean, I'm serious. This happened. Right. But, and it sounds like a joking response, but it's still true. No, yeah. When you focus on too strongly on your diet, your exercise, right. to the extent that you're stressing yourself, you're just cutting your feet off from underneath you. Yeah. It's not that easy. Yeah. No, you. I you like. Need to life. You take a very holistic approach, you know, and maybe that goes into your psychology days, you know, when you did your training there. I don't know. Maybe so. Um, so that you know, we all act crazy. Some we go off the cliff like lemmings sometimes about any old thing, diet, exercise, whatever it is. So, Michael, what? Um, all of those are good, but not. Crazy. What? Yes. I was going to say, so what um, research should people be paying attention to now? You mentioned um, the Blasco work on mice and DePenho, well, Ron's work on my, rats. Should Is that something people should keep up with? What's going on? Is that like that research continuing? Or are there other things that people should be looking at as far as if they're interested in the research out there? Well, if they're just interested in the research, yeah, I'd keep an eye on, on Blasco's work at CNIO um, in Madrid. And I'd probably keep an eye on, De, on DePino's work now at the University of Texas. Um, but I, you know, if I did a search term, it would probably be telomerase. Um, and um, still, from a practical perspective, sort of none of it matters. Because the question still is, can we do anything for you? And most of this is still in the lab. Yeah. Um, hopefully, uh, right now, the biotech company that, we're, that I'm doing, Telesite, has no web presence. And we've done that on purpose. We're staying specifically under the radar. Yeah. Um, but we'll begin to become public soon. And what we're aiming at is exactly what I said, a practical treatment, not research, but I want to fix people. Can you talk about telesite? Yeah. Or is it too uh, early? A little bit anyway. uh, it's if you can, that's bit, fine. A little bit I can say. Um, I had been working with another company uh, that tried another approach, and, and they had some both financial and, and human relations problems. Um and I got out of it for a while, but some people came back to me and said, would you like to try a different approach? Not the previous approach, but totally different approach. Uh, and I said, yes, I would. Um, so it, it, partly it has to do with a, a, a friend in the UK who's been pushing me to do this. Again, his, his mother has Alzheimer's. And a number of researchers who've come to me, uh, again, because they have relatives with Alzheimer's, they want me to do this. And then I'm forming a collaboration with, with some people in Europe um, where we are right now is trying to settle some, some issues of the intellectual property, the patents. Um, but we're ready to move ahead with the financing, the term sheets, the organizational structure. Um, and we already have some um, big global consulting firms that are involved in FDA issues uh, who want to advise us uh, to help us get through the FDA in the most efficient possible manner. Mm -hmm. But we'll see what happens. Yeah. What is – and by the way, Michael, if you have to check in with someone, let me know if there's someone who you need yeah. you need to uh, check in with someone who is... My, my wife came by and waved to me. Okay. So... Okay. Um, but I wonder, what's the hardest part about your job? Not getting things done yet. The hardest part is uh, knowing that no matter how fast you move, no matter what you do, there will be people who died or suffered because you weren't fast enough, mm. period. That's the hardest part. It's the emotional part. Mm. Um, I, you know, I, yeah, I could get down to, to concrete specifics, but now the hardest part is just knowing them how fast you move, move it isn't fast enough. Yeah. Is that a big driving force for you when you are just trying to get as much done? Because you know if it doesn't come out fast enough that certain people are not going to be able to get the therapies and, and die, essentially. Yes, it is. Um, you know, every time I take a minute to go out and, and work in my garden, I yeah, it increases my joy and lowers my stress, but it also reminds me that um, I wish I was moving faster. 
uh, when we're trying to settle the IP issues, or the financing issues, or the FDA regulatory issues, or the SEC issues or something, um, it needs doing. But it's one more thing that I recognize as also causing long, it's, you know, it's, it's not helping the people in the next room who are dying in a sense. Yeah, it's delaying, yeah. And that goes to, I'm also curious about what you do in your health regimen. It seems like gardening is a big, big uh, thing that you do. Oh, I still remember. I was working for a global consulting firm a couple of years ago, big, involved with computers and medicine, uh, which I wrote a book on as well. Um, but, you know, they, they would call you every few months, every six months to make sure that you weren't smoking, that you were wearing your seatbelt, that you were eating right. That, um, and one of their, their uh, hobby horses was exercise. Are you exercising? And I would respond, yeah, I'm gardening. And they'd say, that's not exercise. Well, for me, gardening is a full-time, full-body contact sport. Um, and most of the people who are complaining about this probably sat at a desk, and they weren't literally with a wheelbarrow and a pitchfork hauling 20 yards, cubic yards of mulch around. Right. And I do. <laughs> yeah, if they want to say that exercise, I'd love to have them come give me a hand for a couple of days moving that stuff because it's exercise. Um, so I, my exercise tends to be daily movement. Um, I seldom sit in one place. If I go to a medical conference, you'll find me in the back, usually stretching because I can't sit that long. And I think a lot of people who, who are in good shape tend to do that. Uh, they tend to to exercise not as I went to the gym, but they bound up the, they don't trudge up the stairs. They bound up the stairs. Uh, they move like this. Um, I, you know, for myself, I notice when I exercise, I gain weight. I assume it's muscle mass. If I stop exercising, I lose weight. I, you know, um, so that's genetic. Personally, you know, I've always been a meditator ever yeah. since I was a teenager. They, those stories about the, the Buddhist monasteries sort of true. Um, uh, it, but uh, the other thing is I got involved in brewer's yeast years ago, which is probably a good source of vitamins. And my usual joke about it is that I know it must be effective because it never gets advertised. Uh, it doesn't cost very much and it tastes like, oh, God, you know. So it How must do you be eat good it? for you. It tastes that bad. I, I mix it in orange juice. Hmm. There's an old, uh, there's an old uh, natural food cookbook by Beatrice Trum Hunter. I met her once. She and her husband would have it in either hot water or cold water, one one, one the other. Everybody different. Um, but it does seem to make my day go better. Is that placebo? Could be. Got me. That's about it. I'm sorry. Don't have anything better I at like, all. Those Except are good that, ones, actually. Again, again, remember to keep things in your life that add joy and pleasure. Uh, you know, Robert Heinlein once, uh, somebody said, he said, what are the three keys to a good marriage? And he said, um, one, make a budget and stick to it. Rule two was always budget the luxuries first. Yeah, you, you know, you need that bottle of champagne now and then, not just water, not just orange juice. Um, the third rule, interesting, was always rub your wife's feet, which is good, good rule, but that doesn't bear much. <laughs> My wife will love – this will be her favorite interview when I, I'm going to have her watch this exact moment. She'll be, she will we'll come to Michigan, and she will just give you a big hug because of that one. Come visit the gardens. I'll, I will send you a picture of the water lily garden, which was another odd story. It, it took me two years to finish it. I borrowed a bulldozer and made this water lily garden. And for two years, my wife was ragging on me about what an ugly spot that was and what was I doing this for. And she looked at it when I got done and said, you know, you were right all along. And so now whenever I do something and she says, I'm not sure, I say, remember the water like that? She said, yeah, I probably left that. <laughs> That's a lifesaver right there. Um, so what do you like to garden? What do you like Good to investment. grow? What do you like to grow in your garden? I say anything that grows in a zone five, I either grow or I've tried. If it doesn't grow in a zone five, I probably try it anyway. You know, bougainvillea does not grow in Michigan. Isn't going to happen. But I remember there's a plant, Clematis Montana Rubens. Doesn't quite grow in my zone, but I keep trying. Anything edible or only different flowers? Yes. Oh, yeah. I mean, it used to be that we had about a dozen kinds of basil and, you know, a half a dozen or more kinds of eggplant. No, now I've mostly gone down to peas and and basil and dill and um well, you know zucchini tomatoes mm. usual stuff peppers but i've cut way back so michael you've been meditating for 40 years what can and i, not I all the time They're only intermittently like in the morning not the whole 40 yeah. years <laughs> thanks i appreciate that um <laughs> Just clarify that. what should you what should you, you know i always hear the most successful highly successful highly functional you know, productive people meditate. And it always kind of has this almost, 
Uh, I can't really picture what people are doing. What should I be doing? What should other people be doing in regards to meditation? Well, as you probably know, there are two basic schools of meditation. One is stop paying attention to everything around you. The other is pay attention to everything around you. Yeah. Don't think, just pay attention to it. Mm -hmm. um, and the latter being sort of uh, Zazen or the most Buddhist forms um, as opposed to undermine that part. But, okay, we'll stick with this sort of attentive forms. Yeah. Uh, you know, the, the, there's that old story about the Buddhist, uh, the Buddhist uh, master who said the key to meditation was attention, attention, attention. But it reminds me of something. There was a, there's an Israeli historian who wrote a, a great book, um, although it's been sort of um, been a lot of argument about it, uh, about so-called conceptual revolution back 75, 90,000 years ago. And his argument was that human beings originally were very good at saying spear, bison, you know, giraffe, uh, water, but, but originally didn't have any concepts of things that, quote, don't exist, like General Motors uh, or Organization or Tuesday. That or, makes you know. sense. Yeah, and, and yet... Uh, and the funny thing is, as he pointed out, if you take an organization like um, like General Motors, it, it doesn't exist. You can't find it anywhere. You can find a building, but that's not General Motors. You can find the CEO, but that's not General Motors. And what's interesting is you can't kill it with a spear or a gun, but you can kill it with a court order. That is something that, again, doesn't exist. Um, but what's interesting is that most of the things that you and I deal with every day don't exist. Aging. Well, we age, but point to aging. Grab it. Let me steal it from you. Let me eat it. I can't. It doesn't exist. Uh, it exists as a concept, and it's a crucial one because it allows us to do things. But but most of the things that you and I do day to day, including this entire conversation, almost never involve things that you can touch. Now, here's my coffee cup. I can touch it. There's liquid in it. I can touch it. But the fact that it's a coffee cup, no, it's, it's what it is. You know what I mean? It's this. Um I'm tempted right now to just smash it and break it to make a point, but I won't. <laughs> but what I mean is most of what we deal with doesn't exist really. It's critical for human humanity for us to talk about love, talk about solving disease, but it's not tangible. And I think one of the keys to age to, to meditation, um, at least in the Buddhist form, for example, is to remind us to focus on what's real. So, for example, in typical Zazen fashion, you start a beginner off with counting breaths, paying attention to breathing. But the key is to pay attention to what I can hear, what I can see, what I can feel, what I can smell. Mm. Or even if I go back to what's called the Abhidhamma, it's the, the old high, high teaching. Uh, it turned out to be a psychology text in some ways. They talked about the sixth sense, which was paying attention to what you're thinking. Uh, but the point is to pay attention. Not to get caught up in is the matters. Oh, I'm late. What if my boss gets me? Oh, my wife is mad. No. What's right here, right now? What am I attending to? When we forget that, I think we lose track of a lot of what life is about. I am not saying that we shouldn't be focusing on aging and organizational structures and love and things that uh, truth. Um, you know, yeah, those are critical things. General Motors, for that matter, Telesight. Um, but that's not all there is in real life. A lot of it is what's right in front of us, mm -hmm. and too often we stop and don't even see the roses, let alone smell them. Mm -hmm. What's your routine? What do you usually do in the mor uh, meditate in the morning? I do morning and evening. Yeah. Very short, but, but again, just long enough to remind me to pay attention. Yeah. It also, uh, you know, people talk about centering, and I don't know if you've ever thrown pots, but it's, it's a good analogy. Um, I find myself less sort of wobbling back and forth in my brain if I settle down and focus. Hmm. It lets it, it's a little easier for me to do things like uh, write or, or talk to people and be rational than if I just let myself sort of wobble around vaguely. Yeah. What did you... I, I mean, for all I know, it's total nonsense. But it, it's like me and, the, and you know, me and Brewer's yeast. My day seems to go better. If that's a placebo, it's a cheap placebo. Right. And if meditation is a placebo, it's a cheap placebo. I'll keep doing it. Yeah. Not because it's religion. I, you know, I used to have a problem with my patients 20 years ago. When I talk about yoga, I couldn't because they thought it was a religion. So I had to talk about stretching exercises. Right. You know, now I can say yoga and everybody gets it. Well, that's the same sense I mean about meditation. This is not, not a question. I, one, of the, one of the foremost practitioners I ever knew was a Jesuit priest. He saw no contradiction between sort of being a Buddhist and a Jesuit, but that's a Jesuit for you. Um, but the point I'm making is that it's not going to be religious. It, it's a question of stretching your mind, relaxing, whatever it is. works for me. Yeah. yeah. What did you learn at the monastery? 
Oh, that was funny. It, actually, the story I told, part of it anyway, in my very first book, but I was in a Buddhist monastery. It was a Buddhist monastery in England, of all places. And there were, monk, there were people from all over the world, but there were these two Thai students who came to me one day. And these Thai students said, listen, we've noticed you're a Westerner. Yeah, I am. Um, and we have a question about Western religion. There are some minor sects that we don't understand. And I thought, oh, my God, they're going to ask me about the difference between Methodist and Baptist. And I have no idea. How to, <laughs> no idea. So I said, listen, I, I got to tell you, I'll, I'll answer whatever I can, but there's a lot I just don't know. What are the minor sects you were thinking of? And they looked at me and said, well, there were these three minor sects they'd heard of, and they're called um, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. Is that right? Well, I thought about it for a minute, and I thought, yeah, I see what you mean. And let's see, holy books, prophets, commandments, sin. Wow, you're right, monotheism. I, yeah, I see what you mean. It's, from their perspective, they were all one. I spent a half an hour trying to explain the difference between those three to us different religions, to them minor sectarian confusion. And I still think they were only being polite when they said, oh, okay, thank you, we, we understand. <laughs> sure we do. Then I turned to them and I said, well, I was trying to be polite, and I said, well, tell me about Buddhism. And they said, you mean our Buddhism, the true one in Thailand, or all those heathen Buddhism sects they practice everywhere else in Asia? And again, I thought, you know, we're not so different, are we? Huh. I practice the true religion. Yours is heathen. No matter who you, are, you, don't want your, you don't want your son or daughter marrying one. You know, this is nuts, but it's very human. Isn't it? <laughs> Sad. Oh, God. Yeah, I, I don't think I would be able to take on that task of explaining those three religions to those people and the differences. So. Well, their framework was so distant from, from the framework I'm used to that for them it was, it was like me trying to tell the difference between two little stars in the center of the galaxy. Makes a big deal if you live there, but to us it's just one big clump. Yeah. Michael, you know, I, I sent you a question, and you had a really interesting answer to it. When I asked about some of the most valuable advice you've received uh, from the scientific community, and you wrote back to me with a really unexpected response about um, people saying you just can't do certain things. Can you talk about that yeah. for a second? Um, it, it reminds it started off with something that happened to me in high school, where a guidance counselor told me I, was, I wasn't good enough to go to college. And I remember thinking, some version of, well, let's just be polite and say, no. <laughs> F, F you type yeah. of thing. Yeah. Thank you very much for your opinion. Um, and, and so what my advice to many people is never, ever, ever let, tell, t let people tell you what you can't do, what can't be done. Never. Uh, you know, it, it, if, um, if people tell you that you can't have any gravity, maybe they're right. But until you try it and fail, you don't know that you can't do it. If people tell me that you can't, um, you know, walk a tightrope, try it out. I mean, you may break a leg, but it, never believe people. Um, so I ran into a lot of people in life who tell me or other people something couldn't be done. You can't fix aging. Everybody knows that. You can't fix it. Um, or you can't go to college or you can't. No, I thank you very much for your advice. Don't do it. Never, ever, ever pay attention to people. It reminds me of something I said to you earlier, which is, you know, we're talking about the def or the, the way you pronounce telomere. Um, you could pronounce it telomere, teramiro, teramasu, teramaras. Right. Um, but the question is, do you communicate? And your pronunciation is right. My pronunciation is right. The fact that they're different cuts no ways. As long as we understand mm -hmm. what we're talking about. The same thing is true of clothing. What's in fashion? What is a matter of what I'm wearing? Now, I grant you that what I wear conveys an image to other people. and it, Okay, but still, what I decide to wear is up to me. Um, and how I decide to pronounce things is up to me. I always tell my students, if you want to pronounce it, tell, uh, telomere, go right ahead. The question is, do you communicate? I may make fun of it, but so what? Ignore me. Go right ahead. Never let other people tell you what you cannot do. Listen, there was a, a great piece of advice from Miss Manners years ago. Someone wrote in. And they said, how do I deal with my mother-in-law? She's always telling me how to treat my husband, how to treat the kids, how to clean the house, how to make dinner. I'm tired of her advice. Do I have to listen to it? Miss Manners wrote back very nicely. She said, absolutely. You do need to listen to her. In fact, when she gives you advice, ask her questions so it's clear that you've listened and clear that you've understood her advice. And then ignore it because it's none of her damn business. <laughs> right. Yeah. We can be polite enough to ask other people, but don't let people run your life ever. You know, Michael, there's an example of this too 
um, what happened when someone reviewed your your textbook? Oh, that was funny. Um, the uh, my textbook got reviewed in Science Magazine. You're right. And the person who reviewed, you know, this is a medical textbook about clinical implications of something. And the person who reviewed it was an ornithologist, actually a zoologist, but he focused on birds, so he's an ornithologist. And his complaint was that I wasn't doing active research on this. I was a clinician. And I thought, yeah, I'm a clinician. I'm writing a clinical textbook. And you as a bird specialist are telling me I should be doing research when you are doing research, but it's a clinical textbook. I'm doing clinical medicine. Um, and somebody said to me, you know, why don't you write in a letter to Science Magazine and complain about this? Tell me the other side. Tell me it's wrong. And my response was, it's dust in the wind. Because it doesn't matter what he thinks or what somebody else thinks or what I think. The question is, does it work? So the fact that he wrote that in, I'm sorry he felt that way. I mean, he's an idiot. Um, but <laughs> that's not the point. The question is, does it work? And we're going to find that out. Right. Right. And so, you know, I always like to ask... Michael, about the lowest moment, lowest point. And you alluded to it before a little bit. Can you ta tell a little bit, uh, a little bit more details around that low point? Not really. I, I, you know, I'd love to. The, the point was I put six months of my life into that, mm -hmm. and I, I saw the clinical value in being able to take all this research and test it. Find out if it works. Could we make people's lives better? And having somebody pull the rug out from underneath me. It was interesting because, you know, when I first got the author offer, I thought this can't be real. And they flew me out to California and I did my, my homework, did my due diligence. And they really did have the money for this. I think they were the seventh uh, most wealthy people in the U.S. or something. Hmm. Um, and they wanted to do it. So it was a little unclear to me. Um, why are things going to go wrong? But they certainly did very fast. Yeah. Again, the night before we were supposed to sign the final financial arrangements. Um, there's nothing I could do except accept that. There really wasn't. You know, for a while I took it personally. I must have done something personally wrong. That turned out not to be true. Yeah. For a while I was convinced there must be somebody out there who was telling evil stories and lies about me. Probably not true. It was just one of those things yeah. in life. And like so many things, whether it's that or getting cancer, where the answer is, yep, okay, deal with it. Um, Here's another thing, though. It, it reminds me of the mistakes I make in life. And when I when I teach my course, for example, on aging, one of the very first things I do the first day is I tell them not necessarily to believe me. I often, by the way, tell the students they'll get 10 extra points right off the bat, top of the course, uh, for catching me saying something's wrong and proving it. Stand up, tell me I'm wrong. Here's the place on the Internet. I found this source, and here's the research. You're wrong. Prove it. Because Yeah, because I do make mistakes. So I tell them the story about myself and the swing which is a classic. When my kids were young, call them five years old, we have a maple tree in front, and I decided to put up a swing. Perfectly rational thing to do. So I went to the hardware store and I bought rope. I went out to the, the barn. I found a board. I drilled holes through it. I took the ladder. I put it up the tree, tied myself, the knots up there, brought the rope down, put it through the board, tied myself, the knots in that rope, and sat on it. And it was about a six inches to eight inches off the ground way too low oh my god i thought now i've got to get a shovel and dig the dirt down <laughs> see what i mean it took me a week before i thought to myself you moron you tied the knots untie the knots lift it up time again so whenever i think i'm doing something wrong i remember the this this you know the swing and i have a slide where i show that my students the swing with diagrams of exactly what i did and i said what would you do and the answer is pretty obvious to everybody tie the knots again but I said, let me tell you what I did. So next time I tell you that we can, for example, reverse aging, you should be saying to yourself, is this another example of the swing? Is this guy an idiot? Because what you want to do is see if it works. <laughs> right. It's not a question of what I'm telling you as the professor. Counts not. Mox Nix doesn't count. No, makes no difference. The question is, does it work? Again, test the swing. Yeah. Don't trust me because I'm the MD, PhD. Find the data. Yeah. See if it works. Yeah. I just know uh, you could have done a lot of good with that billion dollars. So it's too bad. But it is what it is. Probably so. It is what it is. So what, what else can I tell you about? What else? I, I want to hear on the flip side. I, mean, you know, I want to depress you, leave you depressed. But uh, <laughs> what's, been, no, I won't depress. What's, what's been 
one of the proudest moments. Uh, I think not just proudest. Sometimes, sometimes it's a matter of the fun of it um, and, and dealing with adversity. Here's one that I loved. Um, I'm at the Smithsonian Institute. And in any big audience, there's always somebody or a classroom. There's always somebody who glowers at you the entire time. And right up in the second row on the right-hand side by the aisle, there's a guy who glowered at me right from the beginning as though I had shot his dog. And I, so every time I talk, I'd aim at him. If I made a joke, I'd aim at him. It never made a difference. I mean, he just glowered at me. And I knew I was in trouble when his hand went up for the questions. He got second to last question. He grabbed the microphone. You could see his knuckles squeeze. And he started off with this attitude. He said, Dr. Fossil, isn't it true that, I thought, I don't know what you're about to end this with, but it doesn't matter, I'm in trouble. He said, isn't it true that everything you've said, everything without exception, has only been done in cells and only in the laboratory. None of this has been done on people or on animals yet. Isn't that not true? I said, yes, well, I'll put succinctly summarized. Thank you, next question, because that's the right answer. He wanted me to be defensive. And I was so proud of myself for thinking, I don't have to be defensive. He's right. Okay. That's it. Move on. I was very pleased with that. It was a high point. (laughs) I think I disappointed him terribly. I'm sorry, but he was right. What about again? Yeah. Me the data. Yeah. Your books are high points too. How long does it take you to finish a book? Um, My wife says it's about two and a half years. When I misestimate it, she was about two and a half years. This last one probably only took me about two. But I, I ran into a really good editor. Um, the first time I had an editor that was very good technically, but a horrible human being, um, he would he would get on the phone and sort of yell at me and rant about things that, and then he'd say, "How did why did I spend an last hour asking about the difference between that and which?" And I think, "Wait, why did you? I just tell me to go check it out and fix it." Um, and the uh, I remember with you know there are other problems like that, but this editor has just been a delight. He gets it from the word go. Uh, and the rewrites have always been, it, without exception, improvements, not things where I think, now you're cutting out the good part. No. Every time he made some change or suggested a change, I thought, good thought. Well done. So I'm very happy with him. Yeah. So I also wanted to hear about some of your mentors and or colleagues that have influenced you. I know you mentioned a few. Uh, I'll, tell Noel. You, well, I'll tell you a couple of stories going all the way back. First of all, there was an English teacher, I'll never forget, this is probably seventh grade. Yeah, probably seventh grade grade. Um, and it was uh, Baldy Smith, Baldwin Smith. And what I liked about him was that he was honest. Here's an example. He turned to a whole class one day in English and said, every sentence where you use a preposition have to ha- has to have an antecedent. I raised my hand and said, well, well, that may be true, but then if I say it's raining, what's the antecedent for it? He looked at me and said, almost every sentence. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, there's a sort of an understood antecedent. And I caught him on it. I, I was really asking. I couldn't understand why he'd say this when I knew there was an exception because it is raining. Is It is the weather is raining. The sky is raining. The world is raining. Wait, what's raining? Something is. It is. The time now. Um, but the second one I remember was in college. And this was um, my advisor who ended up liking me because I had the guts to stand up and say things that were politically uncomfortable. These were the days of the Vietnam War. And um, I had ended up being a member in the faculty senate as an undergraduate for reasons that escaped me. And they were trying to vote that the university was against the war. And I stood up and said, listen, most of us in this room are against the war. I'm fine with being against the war. But I have two problems. One is the university is not a citizen. It can't get drafted. It can't vote. Two, there are probably exceptions. There are probably minorities in this whole university who disagree with that. So who are we to stand up here and say, our university is against the war? You could say you are, or I am, or we are, but not the university. Well, I got shouted down. But again, this professor respected me because I was willing to stand up and say that even though it was not a comfortable position. Yeah. Everybody knew I was an idiot. Well, that's the way I felt about it, you know? Uh, so those kind of moments, those are mentors that matter to me because they, again, they're the ones who stood up and said, you know, yeah. you're all right. I'm glad you did that. Even though it was uncomfortable. Yeah. 
I had the same thing happen with my uh, my uh, you know the person who got me sort of into medical school. Who, and in this case, Don Kennedy too. Don Kennedy used to be the president of, of Stanford, and he's one of the people. Um, in fact, he used to be head of FDA. Too. Hmm. But he's the one who who said, "Listen, you know the the department that threw you out completely wrong. We'll put you back in." And I said, "No, I, you know I'd rather be out of it." But the point is, he was willing to stand up for me, um, and I'm glad he did. It it gave me faith that there are people out there who actually think about what's right. Yeah. And Michael, this has been hugely valuable. I really appreciate your time. And um, I have one last question. Uh, but before I ask it, where can we point people towards? What should they check out? They can check out your book, The Telemarie's uh, Revolution on Amazon. Where else should we point people towards to check out uh, about you? Yeah, the book comes out October 6th. So anybody can pre-order it, but that's when it comes out. You won't mm -hmm. get it till then. Mm -hmm. um, they can follow my uh, my website. Um, when I get around to it, I mean to do a weekly blog. I'm not always good about that. I'll probably get better at it. Um, and what I'm going to try to do is let people know where we really are in the research. Right now, I'm mm -hmm. more talking about how this works, why it works, what it, you know, what it's all about. For example, mm -hmm. how does Alzheimer's really work? But you can keep an eye on that. If you're doing web searches, for example, with Google, uh, uh, you might flag telomerase uh, or telomerase interventions or telomerase therapy, mm -hmm. that kind of thing. Um, but you'll often get, you know, I get a typical 14 articles a, a week uh, and 13 and a half of them are worthless. But still, those are the kind of places I would look. Yeah. I mean, your your website is your full name, right? Yes. It's Michael, Michael Fossil, F-O-S-S-E-L dot com. Dot com. Yep. Yeah. Check and it once out. And once we put up the Telesite website, I own Telesite.com, but I haven't put it up yet. And again... We'll get there. They're more. It's more important to do their work than to publicize it. Yeah. So I have two, a couple notes here. So I'll let you determine what you want to talk about. Uh, but I have a note about Mrs. Johnson at 92 years old. I have a note about interfering with God's will. And obviously I have a note about you that you have secret scare staircases in your house um, yeah. and a one-way mirror, which kind of scares me. But so which... Uh... No, no, I mean... I I will tell you, we do have two secret staircases. One of them where you push the DVD that's called, this DVD says the secret staircase. You push the button on it and the secret staircase pops out. Built that way myself for fun of it. That's amazing. Um, but let me tell you again about the Mrs. Johnson story and yeah. about the, the God's will story just because it, it gets the point across. Yeah. Um, a lot of, well, this actually, let's just tell you the story about Mrs. Johnson. This is back now 19 years ago. And I'm in the hospital and in comes a reporter. And he wants to talk to some older pe people about the work I'm interested in. And I say, well, I'll tell you, I've got a patient, Mrs. Johnson. She's 92 years old. She's here for pneumonia. She's in room one. I'll ask her if she can talk to you. She said, you're happy to. So when he comes in and he says, let me ask you something, Mrs. Johnson. If Dr. Fossil had a pill to reverse aging, would you take it? She said, I'm making the voice up, but she said, no, I'd let nature take its course. And I said, Mrs. Johnson, I have a question for you. As I look at your knuckles, I noticed they're sort of swollen. Why is that? She said, oh, the arthritis is terrible, and the Motrin just doesn't cut it anymore. And I said, and, and I noticed here you've got a big scar right across your chest. What is that? She said, oh, I had a quadruple bypass a few years back because they were worried about my arteries. I said, huh. And, and tell me, why are you here today? She said, oh, I'm here because I've got pneumonia. I think I need to be, oh, I see what you're driving at. <laughs> Because aging sounds fine, or reverse aging, maybe, you know, maybe I do, maybe I don't want to do it, until you make it practical. And the practical truth is nobody likes arthritis, nobody likes quadruple bypasses. And I run into this when I talk to biologists, and they'll tell me that aging is not a disease. And like tel telomere, tel telomere, I don't care. But they act like it's a disease. The same biologist who says aging is not a disease dyes their hair, they get Botox injections, right. they go in for quadruple bypass, while they're telling me that this doesn't count. That's somehow not aging. Okay. Uh, telomere, telomere, potato, potato, me, <laughs> but still all you act like it is a disease. And then there's the one about God's will. Um, and, and a lot of times when I talk about aging, the, the problem people have is emotional. It's not intellectual. It's an emotional issue. Um, and it's at its purest form, it's are you interfering with God's will? Yeah. And my answer to that is a medical one, which is if I had and I have had this, a five-year-old girl gets hit on her bicycle by a car, and she comes in, it's major trauma. 
or is it God's will? I'll interview. If I have, and I've had this, 41-year-old woman, two kids, she's got rectal cancer. It's God's will, or should I try to do something about it? And I have had cases where you got a 75-year-old guy with a heart attack. God's will? My job as a physician is to intervene, and I will. And I guess my take is that if somebody thinks that all of that is God's will, they are welcome to, um, but they're also welcome to their own God, and I'll take mine. I would prefer a compassionate response to things like that, and I think most people would, rather than saying, well, it's God's will, so I'll let you die. Mm -hmm. I don't care what your age is, whether you're five years old, 50 years old, or 500 years old. The question is, can I help? Uh, it's, I think, for us all, not a matter of uh, God's will, but of human work. And our work, our lives should be dedicated to make other people's lives better. And if you're not, I prefer doing it my way. Yeah. No, I like how you put that. But it's not about playing God. It's a matter of working at being human. Right. I mean, I'm not going to let you end on this because I remembered. <laughs> Serious. <laughs> because um, I still am wondering how your wife let you get away with having a rat lab at home. Uh, she told me I wasn't supposed to tell anybody that, but I, I, I mean, do. Yeah, it. I got interested in that now 30 or 40 years ago because some of the original data suggested that dehydroepiandrosterone or androsterone sulfate, either one, might have an effect in reversing aging in rats. So what I did was I built a rat lab in the basement, probably the only rat lab in the world with Laura Ashley wallpaper. Um, and I bought several hundred rats. And rather than make the steroids, I ordered the steroids. I ordered 12 different steroids that were sterically related to DHEA and DHEAS. Uh, and I put them all into my rats. And after about two or three years, they were all dead, and they all had the same number of tumors, the same lifespan, the same everything else, and I decided it didn't work. So there went my rats. Your wife must be a saint. I think so, too. Michael, I appreciate your time. Thank you so much. It's been, uh, it's been a pleasure. Jeremy, you and your wife come by the gardens anytime. Not in the winter, but come by. We'll do that. Okay. We'd Thank like you. it. Thanks, Jeremy. Bye. Bye.
do the fun. Came out better.